Well, this week our Bible reading took us all the way through the book of Joshua. We started, I think, with Joshua last Sunday, and if I'm not mistaken, I think we finished yesterday. That's about right. Pretty close anyway. And if you think about the book of Joshua, wow, that's a lot of great preaching material. I've preached many sermons out of Joshua in my 27 years um, of, of filling the pulpit. In fact, the, the second sermon I ever preached uh, when I started my ministry, it was from, from the first few chapters of Joshua. My first one, I remember, it was You Must Be Born Again from John 3. And my second one, I remember, was from Joshua 1, 9. That was the key verse. Um, I don't remember all my sermons. In fact, after that second one, they've all blurred together. But I do remember that second one and that key verse from Joshua 1, 9. That's a pretty good key verse for life right now. And so... Uh, I've got a guest speaker that's going to be up on the screen here in just a minute, and he's going to read uh, or recite Joshua 1 9 for us. So uh, give him your attention, and you'll have to listen closely, but it's pretty special. So let's hear this guest speaker from Topeka share our key verse today. Amen. Do not be afraid or terrified, for the Lord God will be with you wherever you go. I love seeing that Facebook post from Savannah with uh, little Jack saying that memory verse. And uh, one of the things Savannah said was it's not just become a, a, just words to him. Uh, now when they go to the doctor or when they go to the dentist or when they do anything scary, Jack will say, are we going to be brave? Are we going to be courageous? And uh, his mom will say, yes, we are. So that's a very good uh, uh, little sermonette there from Jack to all of us. I've been thinking about what to share with you from the book of Joshua. All the possible things to preach on. The Lord's charge to Joshua. Rahab hiding the spies. Crossing the Jordan. Uh, the circumcision at Gilgal, the first Passover in the Promised Land, and the manna stopped on the first day, uh, the day of first fruits, the fall of Jericho, Achan's hidden sin, the battle of Ai, 85 year old Caleb asking for the mountain with the giants in it. Man, there's, there's, there's 10 sermons right there. But we're going we're to do just one on the book of Joshua. So as you read through the book, maybe you are like me, I began to see sort of an overarching theme develop. Uh, a big theme stretching across the pages of this story, across the days um, and years of Joshua's life, across this epic adventure story of how the people of Israel fought for and began to possess this land that God had promised them and that God was giving them. One big theme and then maybe a couple of little themes that fit into the big theme. So the big theme was this, God's plan plus man's obedience always equals success. God's plan plus man's obedience always equals success. And that success is success as God defines success. That was illustrated and shown and proven over and over and over throughout story after story after story in this book, both in the positive and the negative. And what I mean by that, in the positive, when they got God's plan, and they understood God's plan, and they obeyed God's plan, they had success. That'd be the positive. Uh, but then there were several negatives too. When they either didn't get God's plan, or they got God's plan and they didn't obey it, either one of those, either one of those two ways, that never worked. It was always a failure. Um, when they forgot to seek God, or forgot to get his plan, or they didn't obey it, it didn't work. But when God gave them the plan, and they understood it, and they followed it, the result was always success. That's a principle in God's economy. Something we can take and apply to all the aspects of our life, amen? Marriage, God has a plan for marriage. He has revealed his plan for marriage. And if we will take God's plan for marriage and we will obey it, we will align ourselves with it, marriage works. Parenting. God has a plan for parenting, how we're to parent, how we're to, to raise up our children in the way they should go, how we're to, 
to lead them in the ways of the Lord and teach them in the ways of the Lord and instruct them in the ways of the Lord. When we get up and when we lie down, when we go out, when we come in, as we walk along the path, if we will take God's plan and obey it, it always equals success as God defines success, right? Doesn't mean it won't be hard. It doesn't mean there won't be days when it's really painful and we think this isn't working. It doesn't mean there won't be short-term delays or, or setbacks. Uh, I think of, of what we read about Joseph in the book of Genesis. He followed God's plan. He obeyed God's plan. He did what was right. He did what was right in Potiphar's house, and he, and he wound up in jail, and he had to be thinking, man, this isn't working. But in the long run, eventually, after the delays, after the setbacks, it came to pass, and God's success was made manifest. doesn't mean we'll all even survive the process to see the success here on earth. But it does mean that God's kingdom will advance on the earth and his purposes will be accomplished on the earth. And we will eventually see the success. Either we'll see it on the earth while we live here or we'll see it from heaven, from God's perspective, uh, eternally when we get there. As Job said in Job 19, uh, 25 through 27, I know my Redeemer lives. And in the end, he will stand on the earth. And after this skin has been destroyed, my eyes will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. We, we yearn to see God's success and his kingdom come. And it will. God's kingdom will come on earth. His kingdom will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This endeavor that God gave to Joshua was, was a big one. A job too big for him, a job too big for them. Yet he tells them the secret of success in Joshua 1. And this is Joshua 1, uh, 7, 8, and 9. The two verses that come before the one that, that Jack gave to us. And then that one as well. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be terrified. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Let's look at a couple of places where this, <coughs> excuse me, where this big theme gets illustrated in the book of Joshua, gets laid out for us and, and proven to us. By the way, while we're doing this, I want you to be thinking about maybe some places in your life where you could say, okay, here's a, here's a story from my life, just like these stories in Joshua, where I could say, this proved to be true. It proved to be true in my life. God's plan plus my obedience equals success. I knew what God wanted me to do. I did it, and he brought success. Or maybe, maybe you've got a, another uh, testimony example where you knew what God wanted you to do but you didn't do it or you didn't know what God wanted to do and you tried something else in your own effort and it didn't bring success either one of those things be thinking about those because that's going to be my question to you at the end uh, of the sermon today for you to talk about with your families one time when uh, that I wanted to touch on where we saw this principle of God's plan plus man's obedience equaling success was when Joshua got the plan from the captain of the Lord's army, the plan to take Jericho. Joshua didn't uh, have to wonder about the plan because the Lord himself showed up and gave him the plan. Wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't you like that sometimes when you're, when you're sick in the Lord? Uh, Lord, I don't, know, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to handle this problem that I've got. If you were just out walking, you know, maybe in your backyard and all of a sudden you looked up and there was the Lord standing there. I don't know if we'd want that or not, but that's what happened with Joshua. Here it is from Joshua 5, 13 through 15. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Okay, so he wasn't just standing there with his armor on and his sword in his scabbard. His sword was in his hand. He was ready to fight. And Joshua asked him, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, 
but as the commander of the Lord's army, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down in the ground, to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. We know that this is the Lord because he received worship. Angels don't receive worship. Anytime in scriptures when, when an angel appears and somebody often will fall down on their face and worship and the angel says, no, no, don't worship me. I'm, I'm a fellow servant like you. Worship God alone. But the Lord received Joshua's worship and he even said, the place on which you stand is holy. So we know this was the Lord. Anybody remember that old uh, 80s worship song? Mighty warrior, dress for battle. Holy Lord of all is he. I thought about that when I read this because here the Lord appears as that mighty warrior dressed for battle. And Joshua meets him. The Lord uh, is there with his sword drawn and Joshua asks him a question that we would ask. We, 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 and we often ask. Don't we often ask the Lord this? Are you for me? Are you for me, Lord? I think about the disciples in the boat when the, when the storm was on the Sea of Galilee and they said, don't you care about us? We're going to die. And I get that sense from Joshua. Are you for us or against us? Although I really think Joshua didn't know it was the Lord when he asked that question. He just thought it was a man. He thought it was a soldier, a really good soldier with a really sharp sword. And so he wants to know, whose side are you on? But the Lord says, you're asking the wrong question. The question isn't, am I on your side? The question is, Joshua, are you on my side? Are you on my side? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. Maybe in the midst of maybe in the midst of this, because we were asking the Lord, Lord, are you on our side? You see what's happening. You see how the economy is being wrecked and how people are are falling and, and all these terrible things are and how how the nation seems to be ripped apart. Are you on our side? And I think the Lord wants to say, Are you on my side? It's time for you to choose you this day whom ye shall serve. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. So we asked him. And the Lord says, I come as the commander of the Lord's army. And he gives him the battle plan to take Jericho. Now, we don't, we don't have that recorded in Scripture. We don't have the conversation where the Lord tells Joshua how to do it. But we know that, ha that happened because when, when Joshua gets back to the camp and he begins to relay all this back to his, his team of officers, he tells them what the Lord told him. Here's this battle plan. And I don't, I don't think Joshua had to wonder if this was God's plan. But maybe he had to wonder, God, this is a crazy plan. I'm sure the guys in that tent that were listening, it, it would have been fun to be a, a fly on the wall of the tent there as Joshua was telling the, 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 the captains and the lieutenants and, and everybody as he was saying, okay, guys, here's the plan that God gave us. We're going to march around the city once a day for six days. The priests are going to go in the front. We're going to carry the ark in the front and then the trumpeters. And then the whole army is going to march around the city once a day for six days. Total silence. Nobody's going to say anything. And I'm sure at this point their eyes are like, what are you talking about? And on the seventh day, we're going to march around seven times. And then we're all going to shout. And the trumpet's going to blow a long blast. And then the wall's going to fall down flat. And we're all going to go in. Okay, that's the plan. As crazy as God's plan sounded, Joshua knew it was from the Lord and he was committed to obeying it. He was committed to doing things God's way. And I've thought a lot about that scene. I've thought a lot about that, um, that day <clears throat> as they marched around seven times and then they all shouted and the trumpet sounded. And I don't know that God used uh, sound waves, but I think maybe he did. I don't know. Uh, I've shared this a couple of times. Um, but I think maybe it was harmonic resonance. If you have ever looked at that into, uh, in the, into on the computer, looked that up, harmonic resonance. It's this, there's a physics principle that when things, when the right uh, sound frequency can hit something, hit a solid object, if, if the frequency is exactly the right for the, wall, the loudest enough volume for the longest length of time, It'll get the, all the little molecules, all the little atoms in there, all the little neutrons and, and protons lined up and things will just dissolve. I don't know that, I don't know that that's what happened, <clears throat> but I don't need to know. I don't need to have a scientific answer because I know that God created everything out of nothing. 
And I know that he holds all things together. So if God is the one who holds all things together, and he's constantly holding all things together, all he would have to do is not hold the wall together for an instant, and it would collapse. There's a, a, a scripture passage in, in the book of Colossians. This is Colossians 1, 16 through 18. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, governments, spiritual, earthly, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. It's the Lord Jesus that holds us together. Physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, relationally, every kind of way that holds together. It's God who does that. He's the one that creates bonds and he's the one who dissolves bonds. And in an instant, he dissolved the bonds between the molecules in the bricks, in the wall, and the wall fell flat. So God gave Joshua his plan. Joshua applied the plan, understood the plan, put it into action, obeyed the plan. And the result was God defined success. It was kingdom advancing. It was God's purposes moving forward. Everything went according to God's plan until the battle was over. And then something happened. One soldier, a guy by the name of Achan, deviated from the plan. God had said, don't take any plunder. Don't, everything in the city, living or dead, is devoted to destruction. Um, this is all to be devoted to God as, as a kind of first fruits, the first city in the new land. But Achan saw something. And when he saw it, something happened in his heart. It was that James 1 pattern that we talked about Wednesday night, that, that pattern of when we're tempted we're not to say God has tempted us, but we're, we're dragged away and we're enticed by our own evil desires. And then comes a sin in our heart and then that sin conceives and it gives birth to death. And that's what happened. He saw something, he wanted it, he coveted it, he stole it, and then he hid it. Very similar to the, 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 what we talked about on Wednesday night and King David and his sin with Bathsheba. He, he looked he saw, he coveted, he wanted, he stole, and it ended in death. And in this situation, it's going to end in death. It's going to only the death of Achan, but the death of 36 other soldiers who went up uh, in the next battle against the city of Ai, the next, the next town up the road, which was a smaller city. But because of this sin, because the sin was there, because the sin was in the camp, because the sin was hidden and undealt with, it's interesting to me what God says in chapter 7, verse 1. He says that his anger was kindled against Israel. And he says the Israelites have acted unfaithfully. He, the, the sin of the one guy in the camp now has brought a curse on the entire nation. So two things happened when they went up against AI. One, there was a sin problem that was not dealt with. And two, they didn't seek the Lord's plan. The Bible says that uh, they looked at the city and they made a judgment call and they said, well, this city's not nearly as powerful. Their, their army's not nearly, we don't have to send everybody up there. Just send two or 3,000 soldiers up there to take the city. And Joshua didn't get God's plan for the first attack on Ai. And they went up and, and the men of Ai came out and the Bible says that they routed the men of Israel and the men of Israel fled before them and 36 of them were killed. And when word of this reaches Joshua, he is brokenhearted. And, and the Bible says he tore his clothes and he put uh, ashes on his head and dust on his head. And he went and he fell on his face before the Lord, before the ark of the Lord. And he stayed there praying until evening. Can you imagine what would happen if national leaders took that approach when they were faced with a vexing problem? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and I'm going to get on my face and I'm going to seek the Lord. Or if we took that action when we faced a problem and the Lord revealed to him what the issue was. He said, there's sin in the camp and this has to be dealt with. And God gave him a plan for dealing with the sin and Joshua obeyed God's plan. And when God's plan is put together with man's obedience, we know what happens. The sin was dealt with 
Achan was destroyed. The, the, the plunder he took was destroyed. His family was destroyed. His tent was destroyed. It brought destruction on his family, but it removed the curse. And so the second time they went up against Ai, they did get the Lord's plan. And the Lord told Joshua how to set this ambush and how to retreat, and, and, and it was very successful because the sin had been dealt with. They had gotten God's plan, and they obeyed the plan. Another time in scripture where we see a, um, an illustration of this principle was when the Gibeonites came. If you remember, the Gibeonites were just a little bit further up the road from Ai. They were, they were very close. Um, the city of, uh, in the area of Gibeon was there. But they, they, they tricked Joshua. They tricked the Israelites. They, they sent a delegation over. They wore old clothes and they had moldy bread, remember? Um, and they came and their worn out shoes and uh, worn out saddlebags on their donkeys. And they said, oh, we're from far, far away and we've heard about you and we've heard about your God and, and we wanna make a treaty with you. Now, God had said, don't make a treaty with any of the Canaanites. But there's a very interesting scripture in, in Joshua chapter nine, verse 14. Here's what it says. It says, the Israelites sampled their provision, but they did not inquire of the Lord. Man, that's a spiritual principle. How easy is it for us to fall for the deception of the enemy when we don't inquire the Lord? Because the, the devil is a liar and the father of lies, but he's a really good liar. It's very easy to just go on our own understanding, our own judgment calls to look at the evidence in front of us and say, this makes sense to me without inquiring of the Lord. That's why I'm so blessed to, to be in a church where our leadership meets uh, not just for business, but we also have a, another meeting every month just to inquire of the Lord, to say, Lord, we need you. We need your blessing. We need your revelation. We need your understanding. We need to know how to proceed. Uh, because when we don't inquire of the Lord, it's easy to be deceived. And they were deceived, and so they made a, a treaty with the Gibeonites. And just three days later, they found out, oh, man, they tricked us. These guys weren't from far away. They were the next town up the road. Um, and because of that, they end up having to fight a big battle that they wouldn't have had to fight if they had inquired of the Lord. Man, is that true? How many of us can say amen to that? We've had battles we've had to fight because we didn't inquire of the Lord. We didn't get God's word on it. We didn't see what God said about it before we moved. Because they made this treaty with the Gibeonites, five kings, that's 10, five, five kings uh, banded together and they attacked Gibeon, and the Gibeonites sent word to Joshua, hey, we're in a treaty with you now. You guys have got to come up and help us. And so here they are. They're sucked into a battle with five kings that they weren't ready really to fight yet because of this treaty that they made because they didn't get God's word on it. So Joshua marched up. This is Joshua 10, verse 7 and 8. Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men, then the Lord said to Joshua, so they, they get God's plan and they're going to obey it. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them for I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. I love how the Lord talks in past tense when he's talking about this battle. He says, it's over. I've already, it's already won. I've given them into your hand. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be afraid. The battle's already been won. Now, Joshua and his men still had to go fight it, and so do we. We, we have an enemy. We have a battle. We're in it. We've got to fight it. But, but folks, the, the battle's been won. And God, in, God's, in God's vision, it's already done. It's a done deal. It's accomplished. I've given them into your hands. He said to us very soon, I will soon crush Satan under your feet. Amen. He's been defeated. He's been disarmed. Everything's been, all his weapons have been taken away from him. He can't accuse us any longer with the law. It's been nailed to the cross. Amen. The battle's been won. But God tells Joshua, don't be afraid of them. I've given them into your hand. And Joshua is so zealous to obey this plan that God has given him. He asks God, he says, God, there's not enough sunshine. There's not enough sunlight today to get, get the job done. So God, I'm going to make this 
Powerful prayer. Before I, before I say that, let me say one more thing that God had Joshua do. He said, lift up your spear and your javelin and, and point towards them. And, and, and Joshua did. And I got this, this real throwback to the Red Sea, right? Remember when Moses took his cane and stretch out your hand? What's in your hand? So God tells him, lift up your spear. And so he lifted up your spear and, and, and sent them in. And the, the Bible says they didn't have enough sun, sunlight. They didn't have enough time. He says, I'm not, I don't have enough time to get this job done. And so he prayed and he asked the Lord and, and he said, oh Lord, cause the sun to stand still. Cause the sun to stand still. Lengthen my day. Now, I don't know about you, but I probably would have prayed, Lord, slow down the enemy so we can catch him. Um, I probably would have had, had enough faith to say, give me more time to obey you, Lord. That's what he said. Give me more time to obey you. And the Bible says that the Lord heard his prayer and the Lord answered his prayer. And what that tells me is, is when we are in God's plan, obeying God's plan, we can ask him for big things. In fact, I think Jesus said something like that to his disciples. If you ask anything in my name, according to my will, I will do it. It will be given to you. And so when God's plan is, is being acted upon and in obedience, we can ask him some big, big things. The Bible says the sun stopped where it was and, and delayed going down. Now, a lot of people who have really smart intellects get hung up at this point. Uh, people who, who are really logical and, and whatever side of the brain that is, they, they, they stumble at this and they say, well, that just could not have happened. Because obviously the sun doesn't move anyway. It's the earth that's turning. So if the sun were to appear to stand still, the earth would have to stop turning on its axis. And, and if the earth stopped turning, there'd be no uh, gravity would, and centrifugal force would throw everybody off the planet and everything would be thrown into chaos. And so that, that couldn't have happened. I don't have a problem with it at all. No, we serve a God who created everything out of nothing. And if he created everything out of nothing, he can do anything. He spoke the world into existence. There was nothing there. And once he created the earth, he created everything on the earth. He created all the gravitational forces. He created all the laws of physics. He put them into effect and he holds them all together by the power of his word. And so by the power of his word, he can do anything he wants. I don't know how he did it. I don't know if he stopped the earth from turning. I don't know if he set his glory in the sky like he did the first four days of creation. Do you remember the first four days of creation? The first three days of creation? Because on the fourth day, he created the sun. The sun didn't exist before the fourth day of creation. But the Bible says there was evening and there was morning the first day. There was evening and morning the second day. There was evening and morning the third day. The earth was turning. There was some light source because there was a differentiation between evening and morning. And that light source, I think, was the glory of God that was lighting the earth before the sun and the moon and the stars were created. Maybe he utilized that on that day. I don't know what he did. But I do know that what Joshua prayed and asked God for, God gave him. God lengthened his day and he had time to obey the Lord and do what God had, had called him to do and he accomplished it. One thing that, that I find very interesting and I'm just going to share it with you because I think it's interesting. Um, I've thought about this and I've shared this with some of you but if you think, if you look at the globe here and look where Israel is, right there, there's Israel. Um, and so if right there um, on the, uh, near, near Gibeon this battle was being taken place if you were to, to pass a, a rod through the, through the earth right at the, the widest part, well, where would it be the other part of the world? It'd be over here. What's down there? All these Polynesian islands, right? And the South Pacific Islands. Did you know that every culture in this part of the world, in their mythology, has a story of a long night where the sun wouldn't rise? Uh, you kids that have seen the movie Moana, you know about that, that the, the one bad god's supposedly stole the sun or whatever. All these islands have these stories about, uh, one of them has a story where the God of the night was in a battle with the God of the day one, one time and the, the God of the night was winning and he wouldn't let the sun come up and, until the God of the day finally prevailed and the sun came up. Uh, there's another story about a, 
uh, one of their gods who was lassoed the sun and, and kidnapped it and tied it down and wouldn't let it rise. But they all have this story of a long night. Now, what would you expect to, to have if over here on this side of the world they were having a long day? You'd expect over on this side of the world they'd be having a long night. Now, I don't know if there's anything to that. I guess we'll find out when we get in heaven. But I do think it's really interesting that that's a part of their culture and a part of their history and a part of their mythology. So the big theme of Joshua is that God's plan plus man's obedience always equals success. And I mentioned there, there might be a, a little theme that fit into the big theme. And here was the little theme that I saw develop through all those stories. That our obedience as we follow the Lord will require greater steps of faith. Greater and greater steps of faith. The farther we go, the longer we walk with the Lord, the more that he gives to us, the, the more responsibility that he gives to us, the more that, that, that we, he gives us to possess, the more land that he says to take from the enemy. It's going to require greater steps of faith. And we see that played out. A lot of what we see played out in this sort of dynamic, this interplay between the second generation and the first generation. Kind of, it's kind of the Ten Commandments sequel. It's played out several places. If you're paying attention, you can see it, right? Like Rahab's scarlet cord in the window that brought salvation when death was all around, when death was reigning, right? Man, doesn't that, that sound like the Passover when they put the, the blood on the doorposts, right, on the opening? She had to put the scarlet cord out her window. That's that, that's that scarlet cord that stretches from Genesis 3 all the way to Revelation of, of the blood. But wouldn't it have taken great faith to stay inside your house when the wall was falling down? I mean, I think that would have probably taken greater faith than it took to stay inside your house when the death angel was passing over. When the death angel was passing over, I'd want to stay in my house. I'd be like, yeah, I'm staying in my house. I'm keeping my door shut. But when, when your house is in the wall, her house was in the wall. And the wall was falling down. Can you imagine the screaming and the, the sound of the earthquake and whatever else was taking place? It would have been very hard to, to believe God and trust God and stay in your house and depend on only that little red cord in the window. That's going to save me. Yeah. We're saved by faith. By faith, we're saved. It takes greater faith. Scarlet's, the scarlet cord of Rahab in the window. Crossing the Jordan. There's another uh, Ten Commandments or first first generation throwback, right? When they came to the Red Sea, Moses lifted up his rod and the, the waters parted before they entered. But when they got to the Jordan with the second generation, the waters didn't part until they stepped in. They had to step, when their feet stepped in the water, they had enough, and they had to have enough faith to step into the water before it parted. The day that the, the manna stopped, which was the day, the, the third day after Passover. Passover, uh, then on the third day was first fruits, which if you remember, Jesus was crucified on Passover and risen on, on first fruits. Um, so when they entered into the land, uh, when they crossed the Jordan, they celebrated the Passover. Then on the third day after that was the day of first fruits and they ate some of the fruit of the land that day and the manna stopped. There was no more manna. You want to talk about some panic. You know, we've had some uh, days where there's been no toilet paper on the shelves and, and maybe no soup and a few other items. You think about three million people who for 40 years, every day, they haven't gone to Dillon's, but they've gone outside with their basket and they've collected manna for their family. That's how they fed their family for 40 years. It has stopped. And they're only, you know, they're, they're just inside the promised land. So what's that take? God's telling them, guys, you want to eat? You got to take some steps of faith. I've given you this land. Now go settle it. Go take it. Go possess it. That's how it's going to be from now on. It takes greater and greater faith. And God has brought us out, hasn't he? He brought us through the Red Sea, if you will, at salvation. He, he, he brought us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. But it takes greater and greater steps of faith to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Salvation is an event and it's a process. It's an event when he brings us to the Red Sea and it's a process of taking the land. And so we need to take some of those greater steps of obedience.
We see that very clearly in the story of Caleb, who at 85 goes to Joshua and asks for the mountain that was promised to him. Give me the mountain, the mountain with the giants in it, so that I can possess it and take hold. It would have been easier at 45, amen? I heard some of those amens. It would have been easier at 45 than 85. But at 85, he says, I still have the faith to believe God that I can do this. And he, he obeyed the Lord. So God's plan, coupled with our obedience, will always be bring success in the way that God defines success. And it will always take greater steps of faith. It will always take more faith to move forward with the Lord. Do we always know what his plan is? No. We don't always see it. We don't always see it at the moment. But at times when we don't know what his plan is in the specific, for that specific moment, ask this question, what do I know? What do I know? What God? What has God revealed to me? What can I stand on now in this moment? What do I know that God has told me to do? Am I doing those things? And what do I know that God has told me to stop doing or, or quit doing or take out of my life? Am I not doing those things? We know as a nation, that's not true. We're very much doing what God has said don't do. And we're not doing what God has said to do. But is it true about our church? Are we doing what we know God has told us to do? Our family? Me as an individual, am I doing what God has said to do? Here's the plan. Here's the plan. The much the, the, as much as I know now, am I doing that? Let's pray. Lord, we've seen as we've overviewed this book of Joshua, this overarching plan uh, develop this theme that your plan plus our obedience will always equal success. Lord, that works. It works for nations, it works for individuals, it works for churches. It works wherever it's, wherever it's put into to place, Lord. When you give a plan, when you give instructions and we obey them, it will work. You do not change. And so, Lord, we pray that during this time of unrest, during this time where we, we have so many question marks, there's so many things we don't know, Lord, that we will ask ourselves, what do I know? What do I know that the Lord has told me to do? What do I know, Lord, that you have said uh, this needs to, to not be a part of your life. You need to not take any plunder. You need to not hide it under your tent. Lord, that, that I would not do those things. So, Father, we ask you to give us that, that heart of obedience which comes from a heart of faith, believing your word, grasping it, understanding it, putting it into practice. Lord, that we might be like Joshua and go in and possess what you've given us. Thank you, Lord Jesus.